COVID has disrupted the ability of some of them to work. Some of them have gotten sick. Vaccine mandates have disrupted some of the hiring process at Port of Los Angeles. And simultaneously, David, there's a second thing going on because everything got fouled up in the spring of 2021, mainly by COVID. The fact that you usually had an equal number of ships, take the example of the United States, equal number of ships sailing toward the United States, equaled by the number of ships leaving the United States and going back to Asia or Europe, that got all fouled up. Right now, they're all coming toward the United States. There aren't ships going back in the opposite direction. And that has caused the traffic jam that you see off Southern California of giant ships waiting their turn to unload. I'm David Priest. And this is the Lawfare Podcast, October 22nd, 2021. Ports in many countries are experiencing congestion. For weeks now, there have been reports that there will be delays in many common products, and people are wondering, what is causing this, and how can it end? I invited into the virtual jungle studio Greg Easterbrook, who is a former fellow in economics and in governance studies at the Brookings Institution, He was a staff writer, national correspondent, or contributing editor at The Atlantic for nearly 40 years. And more recently, he is the author of The Blue Age, How the U.S. Navy Created Global Prosperity, and Why We're in Danger of Losing It. We talked about everything from the U.S. Navy's dominance of global oceans, to the shipping trade, to the economics of COVID and supply chains. It's the Lawfare Podcast, October 22nd, Container Shipping and Supply Chain Delays with Greg Easterbrook. Let's start with how we got to where we are today. In the past, the ocean waves were full of naval vessels from multiple nations that were often shooting at each other and making global trade on the waves difficult. How did we get to a place where we have so much international trade moving across the oceans uh, until recently, relatively efficiently, and why there isn't fighting going on that's disrupting that? Everybody knows the logical premise that the fact that two things happen at the same time does not mean that one causes the other. We all know this. But sometimes when two things happen at the same time, one did cause the other. And in the case of the Blue Age, I think the two really important things happening at sea in the last 20 years are clearly linked. There's been almost total cessation of warfare at sea and a big decline in piracy. It still occurs, but it's become very rare. In fact, in our lifetimes, everyone listening to this podcast is the longest period without battle at sea since you got to go back 4,000 years to Phoenicia to find a period of the same length without a lot of battle at sea. So what else do we see in the same period? The largest increase in global trade in human history. Trade has increased by leaps and bounds all over the world. Living standards have risen all over the world. Global trade has been good for almost everyone. Of course, of course, you wouldn't say for every single person because you can find some individuals in the Ohio Valley in the United States and in the Midlands region of England who have lost jobs because factories have declined, mainly in home appliance manufacturing is the main place where this has happened in the Western world. But everybody else has enjoyed a higher standard of living. There's 50 people whose living standard has gone up for every one whose living standard has gone down in the United States and the European Union. And really most important from the standpoint of the human family and hard to see, in fact, impossible to see here in the United States where where we're doing this podcast, spectacular decline of destitution throughout the Pacific Rim, especially in China. But 25 years ago, before global trade took off, 90% of the Chinese population lived in extreme destitution by the World Bank definition. Now it's 5%. The the decline of poverty in the Pacific Rim may in fact be one of the most important developments in all of human history. It's unknown in the West. Polls show that people think poverty in Asia is getting worse. It's getting much, much lower. And global trade is the main reason. And we don't 
appreciate it until something goes wrong and you and I are talking right. because right. in recent months something has gone wrong. So what led to this situation? I mean, you you've looked at among other things the role of the the US Navy and the absolute dominance that the United States has had on the on the earth's oceans in the past several decades. Talk through that a little bit. Just just how is it that this not not quite a monopoly, but this dominance leads to this amazing economic growth and globalization. Well, and the, the saying in the old song, "You don't know what it's got, what you've got till it's gone." Think about American naval power. For five hundred years, nations of the West have tried to control the seas. England tried, Spain tried, the Netherlands tried, Portugal tried. Farther back, China tried. Control of the seas has long been a great power objective. Nobody's ever achieved it until the United States in the current generation. We have total control of the sea lanes of the world. And we don't we hardly even seem to be aware of it, let alone appreciative of it. But if it's gone, we're really going to miss it. The, the line that I use to end the Blue Age is, we're living in the Blue Age and we'll really miss it. If it's gone, and the the supply chain mm-hmm. problems we're experiencing right now is a is I hope only a a false alarm that it's that we're not going to lose it. But the main reason is that the United States has made the oceans safe for commerce. the The U.S. Navy acts as a guardian force, not as an invader. We guard the ships of almost all nations, including our strong competitors. U.S. Navy guards Chinese merchant ships. We guard everybody's ships except Iran, Cuba, and North Korea. And and maybe we should guard them too, because the result is more trade, higher living standards, less poverty, and we forget this also, less inflation. Why have we had no inflation in the Western world in 20 years, despite furious money printing by the Fed in the United States and by similar institutions in Europe and in Japan. The reason is the downward pressure on prices created by international trade. And here we are in 2021, the first year in a generation when international trade has been disrupted. What do we immediately see? Resumption of inflation. You know, in preparation for this conversation, I asked two separate people, what percent of items in commerce they thought moved by water. And both of them said the same thing, Greg. They they both said 50%. And you can actually tell us, what what is the actual percent of items in commerce that move by water? And how has that held steady over the years? You have to go north of 50%. It's actually 95%. And that's held amazingly steady for centuries, the total amount of trade rises century by century, and it's risen a lot in the current generation. But the percentage that moves by water, it's almost like it's some kind of natural constant, stays at just about exactly at 95%. You go back to the 8th century when Charlemagne was shipping grain from North Africa to what was then the Holy Roman Empire, Mm -hmm. 95% of it came by water. And 95% of goods moving in commerce today move by water. It's just, it's not only that it's cheaper to move things by water than obviously by air, also by ground, but most of the time there are no obstacles. Railroads can be blocked by borders or by criminals or by revolutions. Once you get goods at sea, they go from point A to point B without disruption. And if anybody tries to disrupt the transit, the United States Navy stops them. Right. So it's been interesting that in recent times, the major disruptions to global traffic on the waves has not been piracy. That's been a a rounding error, perhaps, in global trade, even at its peak moments. But it's been things like accidents. And I think you've noted that there's a sinking or a grounding of a container ship or a bulk carrier or a tug or ferry virtually every single day somewhere in the world. But obviously, an issue came up this this year. In, back in March, I think it was, when the ever-given ship was going through the Suez Canal and uh, didn't quite make it. Now, that points to an interesting shift in this traffic that that you've looked at, which is the increasing containerization of of global commercial trade and these these mega carriers that are being created. I'm hoping you can walk us through a bit of that in terms of the commercial landscape of these international shipping firms and 
the sheer size of these vessels that now carry so much of international goods. Uh, David, I I could walk you through, but actually it would be easier to fly you through. If you look at the modern Megamax container ships that can carry up to 20,000 individual, they call them TEUs. TEUs are container boxes roughly the size of the back of a tractor trailer truck. And the biggest ships now carry around 20,000 of them. You need a helicopter to get on the deck of one of those ships because it's so high above the waterline. Anyone who's ever been to Disney World can maybe remember the Cinderella Castle at Disney World. Sure. The top of the Cinderella Castle, that's the deck line of a Megamax container ship. That's how high up it is. Wow. And one reason piracy has declined so much is that it's impossible for pirates to get on the deck. They're so high above the waterline, you'll never reach it. Ships like this, the most specialized ones are designed exactly for one city pair. And once described in some detail in the Blue Age that was designed for the city pair of Shanghai to Rotterdam, all it does is transit between those two places. Its side tolerances for the Suez Canal are measured down to less than a meter. And its weight and draft and everything else is maximized. These ships are large. If you can imagine an American supercarrier, all of the supercarriers in the world are owned by the United States Navy. The biggest Megamax container ships now are two times the length and four times the weight of the biggest American supercarrier. These things are huge. That's amazing. And what, what's also amazing is just how these these mega ships are are in virtually constant motion instead of going into a port and unloading for weeks on end. It's a day or two when things are working well. And I'm wondering if you could you could walk through like a, an average year of voyages for a ship. I know you you looked a lot at the Evergreen Marine Company out of Taiwan and the ship ever loading ship. I wonder if you could walk through kind of where where some of these ships that aren't on the the city to city route, where do they go? How do they transit and how quickly do they move around? The one that got stuck on the Suez Canal is called Ever Given. Uh, Blue Age describes in detail one of its sister ships, a ship with a wonderful name, Ever Loading. And that ship has been designed to be able to go to any major port in the world. In 2020, it essentially circumnavigated the earth three times, crossing the vastness of the Pacific back and forth from the Pacific Rim to the west coast of California multiple times, four times transiting the Panama Canal so that it could move up the east coast of the United States, couple times headed toward the Horn of Africa and then across the the Indian Ocean. And it was in motion, I forget the exact number, about 90% of the time. If you think of an Uber driver, an Uber driver doesn't make money sitting around waiting for a fare. An Uber driver makes money moving. An airline makes money when its planes are flying. Shipping companies make money when their ships are sailing. And they've customized just about every aspect of the loading and unloading of container ships to keep them docked for as absolute minimum amount of time, moving as much as possible. And what we see now at the Port of Los Angeles, where there's a large group of of Megamax ships waiting for their turn to unload, is that the unloading process got fouled up when people started not reporting for work because of COVID, and the ships couldn't unload super fast as they were used to and go on to the next destination super fast. And that's why the supply chain is, for now, disrupted. One hopes that in 2022, it will return to normal. Let's talk through that a little bit more. So we have these ships, and they're they're moving across the oceans, heading from one port, let's say from a Chinese port like Shanghai, if not the largest in the world, close to the largest in the world, full of goods for, let's say, the harbor in Los Angeles. And normally it will be on a tight schedule. It will arrive. Everything will be ready for it. The the cranes, the longshoremen, the, the warehouses, the, the movement that goes beyond that, everything is timed out. But there are problems now. And one of those problems you mentioned is not enough longshoremen that that we're actually having issues with the people side of this very intricate supply chain. So let's get detailed there. What's what's the personnel side of this that that gets in the way right now in 2021 and what other factors are also slowing down the supply chain? 
Well, personnel is one of them. COVID has disrupted a lot of labor markets, as everybody knows. We're hoping that that gradually returns to normal. But being a being a dock worker in our minds, our, our minds, we think of the docks as the old movie on the waterfront where the dock workers are horribly <laughs> abused and they earn nominal sums and they stand in line at dawn and then they don't get called for the day. Dock workers at the Port of Los Angeles, which is the most important port in the Western Hemisphere, now make from a hundred to three hundred thousand dollars a year. It's a great job. It's just that COVID has disrupted the ability of some of them to work. Some of them have gotten sick. Vaccine mandates, which I, I'm a big supporter of, by the way, have disrupted some of the hiring process at Port of Los Angeles. And simultaneously, David, there's a second thing going on because everything got fouled up in the spring of 2021, mainly by COVID. The fact that you usually had an equal number of ships, take the example of the United States, equal number of ships sailing toward the United States, equaled by the number of ships leaving the United States and going back to Asia or Europe. Right. That got all fouled up. Right now, they're all coming toward the United States. There aren't ships going back in the opposite direction. And that has caused the traffic jam that you see off Southern California of giant ships waiting their turn to unload. And doesn't that also create problems for, and for simplicity, I'll call them the Chinese ports, although there are others. I mean, you've got a capacity in Shanghai of 150 plus of these super cranes that can be moving empty shipping containers off of these mega maxes and then getting them refilled, putting them back on and, and moving them on relatively quickly. But Am I right that because of all of these ships waiting to get into Western ports, you're not getting those shipping containers back in China fast enough to load them and get more products here? Oh, absolutely. Auction mar markets for containers, the, the, the ability to put your material or your goods or whatever it is or raw materials into a container and ship it to the other continent. It is generally auctioned off on a daily basis. The auction price has gone way up in the last six months because China is short of empty boxes and unloaded ships. They've got plenty of goods. There's no shortage of goods in, in the world. The shortage is of ships to move them to the correct location. And as I say, we, we all hope that by the end of 2022, this will be fixed, but it's not fixed now. Yeah, I've seen some reports recently that containers that were available for purchase uh, or rent, I guess you would say, for about $2,000 per container are now running about $20,000 with prices above $30,000 for priority delivery. Uh, I don't even know what priority delivery means in this environment when you end up waiting in a queue uh, outside the harbor to even even get in. Have Have you seen anything quite like this in the past, what, 25, 30 years of the development of this new international shipping regime? Well, the, the big increase in international trade began in the late 1990s. So it's only been a quarter of a century. You, you might say, well, that's not enough time to, to generalize. But this, if it is, this is the first time this particular disruption has happened. The price that people bid for, for TEUs, for containers in motion between the continents, has certainly gone up and down, but never like it has today. And, and I have a quote in the book. I'll, I'll let your listeners know that I signed off on the manuscript of the book in January of 2021. Huh. This quote was true when I signed off. It sure isn't true now. I quote a ship Shipping official is saying it costs less to move a container from Shanghai to Los Angeles than it does to move the same container from one side of Los Angeles to the other. That was true in January of 2021. Now it would cost far more to bring that container from China to Los Angeles because of the it's a marginal market like many. And when, when people start bidding it up, the bidding continues and the container market is really bid up right now. Don't you and I wish we were operating a container ship right now? <laughs> yes, but I think you've pointed to the fact that there, there's no easy solution to this. That is, there's not a magic button you can press. And of course, you know, political leaders are often put into the position of looking for that magic button. So Joe Biden announces that you know we're going to make sure that the Port of Los Angeles is operating 24 hours a day, seven days a week. It's not that easy, is it? 
No, uh, there there are things you can do. I, I I would say that it's maybe easier to visualize this. Two weeks ago, Southwest Airlines had a huge problem with having to cancel a whole bunch of flights on a Saturday mm-hmm. and Sunday. The result was by Monday, all of their planes were in the wrong place. And it took them several days to get their planes back to the right place. And then they resumed normal service. That's the condition that the international shipping business is in right now. And running a port around the clock certainly can help. It's a positive. But as I point out in the Blue Age, Port of Los Angeles already operates around the clock. Uh, They have really creepy looking robot things called automated straddlers that don't have any people operating them that move the boxes into the ideal positions at night when everybody else is sleeping. It's it's like coming into the workshop and finding that the elves made shoes for you. The the people who work at the Port of Los Angeles leave at night. They come back in the morning, all the boxes have been moved and and the robots are waiting for their next uh, round of boxes to play with, but, but now they're adding workers at night too, to increase the, the rate of throughput. It's amazing when we think about potential solutions that one might be, well, l- let's just get more crew on these ships so that they can move faster. And I think that's a real misreading of the situation, isn't it? Because the crews on these, these mega carriers are surprisingly small given the amount of cargo they're carrying. Are tiny. I, I uh, describe in some detail, the largest container ship in the world, a Hong Kong built ship called Al I hope I'm pronouncing this correctly, Algeciras, referring to the port city in Andalusia. No, excuse me, it's in, in Spain that, that that city that they're referring to. Anyway, it's got a it's got an old literary name. It carries twenty three thousand containers. It is four times the weight of an American supercarrier, and it has a crew of twenty three people. That is Amazing, given that it's what probably the length of four football fields and uh, <laughs> carries carries so many goods. So a solution is not just put more crew on there because the crew isn't the problem. the The solution isn't increase operating time because there's only so much time. Yet you have to have you have to have some people on the ground for the warehousing and the movement of critical material, and that's that's just not there. What about the other side of it, though? We're hearing stories about problems in uh, availability of some raw materials like packaging. And the fact is, these containers, you don't just dump in a bunch of toys. You you have to package them in something. You don't just ship books. You have to put the books into boxes. And the books themselves require the pulp. And a lot of publishers are delaying publication dates because they simply don't have the pulp to print the books. So is this a raw material and accessibility problem for the the inputs that are needed for shipping itself? The the first thing I would say is that one of the things I struggle with in Blue Age, and I hope successfully struggle with, is why war has declined so much in our lifetimes. And, And the end of the Cold War, obvious factor. There are other factors as well. The news may give you the impression that war has never been worse the frequency, intensity, and casualty rates of wars has declined throughout your and my lifetime. And one of the reasons is that no primary resource is in shortage. But there are certainly some manufacturing items that are in shortage. Right now, paper supply is short. Uh, There are several things that are short in several parts of the world. And it, it doesn't look like a lack of primary resources. It looks like the thing that we were just talking about, that resources are in the wrong place. The paperboard necessary to make cardboard boxes is sitting in the wrong country right now and can't get a container ship to take it where it's needed. And as as long as that gets straightened out, things will be fine. There's another potential magic button. And th- this one this one is personal because a few years ago, we got ourselves a 3D printer or what's known in the industry as additive manufacturing. And the idea of printing things instead of taking things away, cutting a tree down and making a desk, you actually build it up from the raw formula and the basic materials. Now, there are some national security concerns about additive manufacturing, whether it's the printable guns, whether it's the restricted materials, perhaps proliferation related that countries are able to do with 3D printing. But on the promise side, 3D printing, if done well, additive manufacturing is more efficient and and can be better in many ways. 
I would think that given issues with supply chains and the ability to get goods moved around the world in the last couple of years, but especially the last couple of months, that we would have seen a dramatic rise in people turning to additive manufacturing. Why do you think that hasn't happened? And do you think there is any prospect for additive manufacturing to change the dynamics of this global ocean trade? It certainly could. If you go back and look at the, I mentioned the history in Blue Age of the Xerox 914, the first practical photocopying machine Hmm. of the late 1950s, it was widely ridiculed. It was totally unreliable to break down. The copies were smudgy. It was cheaper to hire a stenographer to make a physical copy than it was was to Xerox, but it gradually improved. And today we take photocopies for granted. We make too many of them and just throw them away because they're so cheap. The same thing could happen with additive manufacturing. It certainly hasn't happened yet. If you wanted an office chair, you'd be a lot happier with the quality of your product and also pay less if you just bought an office chair that was brought to you on a container ship rather than purchasing an entire 3D manufacturing complex and seeing what happens when you put in the plans for an office chair. But that's today. In 20 years, it may be different. And at that time, the need for global shipment of finished products may decline, although you would still see a big need for global shipment of raw materials. The other national security angle on this I'd like to get your thoughts on, it regards the the vulnerability of these. I mean, you've talked about the fact that these ships are you know so large and virtually inaccessible to pirates. However, We've learned from one ship blocking the Suez Canal for a few days that that turned, I think, a little bit longer than that, that you can have some pretty dramatic snowballing effects globally from just a, a single accident or a single incident. Now, right now, we're in a position where the United States Navy is effectively keeping peace on the ocean with 11 nuclear supercarriers when all other nations combined have none at all, or a situation where the United States has, what, 14 ballistic missile submarines, which is about the same number as the rest of the world combined. But if there is conflict on the open seas, if there is some attempt to actually take out the cargo vessels going even just to one country, what effect would that have on the overall global economy in this wider supply chain? Well, any any war at sea, a serious fighting at sea, would v- very rapidly bring to a halt 20% of the global GDP because hmm. shipment by sea would stop. It wouldn't just decline, it would stop. And 20, a 20% decline in the global GDP is what happened in the early 30s during the Great Depression. So serious fighting at sea would create a second Great Depression. I actually think that that fact alone, that's a pretty stark fact, is one reason the United States and China will never fight. We're going to argue a lot. We're not going to fight. No two great powers have ever had an economic dependency relationship like the United States and China. And certainly in 1914, England and Germany did not have an economic dependency relationship, even remotely similar to the one that the United States and China now have. So it's hard to imagine. I quote some professors at the Naval War College saying, imagine a war between the United States and China. What would victory even be? Even if one side won all the battles, that nation would destroy its own economy in the process. What would be victory? And the Chinese are actually more vulnerable to this than the United States is. Almost all of their global trade passes through the South China Sea, which is a relatively confined area. Mm -hmm. Two-thirds of it turns west and passes through the Strait of Malacca, which is a really confined area. The United States military power could shut down the Strait of Malacca in a few hours and bring the Chinese economy grinding to a halt. There's no similar thing. The United States first among nations. We're blessed in practically every way. We're blessed with the two largest coastlines in the world. There's no similar place where China could shut down our trade. So these facts, I think, make fighting at sea unlikely, but 
Wars have started in the past over a lot less. Wars have started very irrationally and and been exemplars of human folly. And if human folly comes back to fighting at sea, I think we'll very quickly see the second global depression. That raises an interesting point about the the rhetoric, because the political rhetoric certainly doesn't sound like what you just said. The political rhetoric is more about China, you know, not following the international rules, whether it's intellectual property or navigation rights, and its aggressive posture in the South China Sea, especially regarding competing territorial claims, the building of islands, the harassment of other shipping, and also the extension of Chinese commercial vessels, such as even fishing trawlers into the territorial waters of countries far, far away. All of that rhetoric is about conflict. And we're not even talking about Taiwan and the recent issues involving uh, Chinese flights near Taiwan. So putting all that together, you sound optimistic that there, there won't be a conflict between China and the US because, to put it simply, both countries have too much to lose, and China even more so. But the political rhetoric seems to be pushing in the other direction. How do you square that? Well, we know from history that nations fear each other, and we know that politicians like to stir the pot. It's a way for politicians to draw attention to themselves. It's certainly true that China's doing all kinds of things that are pretty despicable, especially with their nine dashed lines concept that some of your listeners may know about. The Chinese Communist Party is contemptible. It's awful. But China is doing other things that are good. They're raising their own citizens out of poverty. The greatest public works projects in the world are almost all in China. We've been upset this year as well we should be about flood deaths in the United States numbering into a, a more than 100. That's a terrible number. Flood deaths in China in the past have averaged more than a couple of hundred thousand a year. The Chinese through public works have almost entirely eliminated floods as a public risk. They're doing some good things. But should we use this bellicose rhetoric with them? I would just simply say we, we have a supercarrier strike group in the South China Sea right now. The Royal Navy's one aircraft carrier is in the South China Sea right now. And that ship is the largest ship the Royal Navy has ever built, larger than any battleship. It makes China feel that we're provoking them. Imagine if instead China had the largest warship it had ever built sailing in Long Island Sound right now. Imagine if China's one aircraft carrier was on maneuvers in the Gulf of Mexico right now. We would say, you're provoking us. Mm. You must stop this. You're provoking us. So this, this thing is a two-way street. And I think not, not in, in any way whatsoever excusing the behavior of the Chinese Communist Party that should never be excused. But we should try to see the world through China's eyes. Through China, You look through China's eyes and China sees a lot of the same things that we complain about seeing when we look at China. Understood. So let's bring it all back to the, the current situation to, to wrap up. You've spoken with the executives and a lot of workers at these major international shipping companies that most of us don't even know the names of, even though our daily lives rely on them in so many ways. You've talked to people operating these ports. How do you see this supply chain bottleneck issue playing out in the coming weeks and months? I've, I've seen some observers saying we've, we're at the peak and it is already turning the corner and getting better and it's just going to take a little bit of time to work through. I've seen others saying we're not even close to the peak, that the backups are getting worse and one other incident anywhere in the world will actually make this something that could last for years. Where do you come down on this? How do we, how do we get through this period? Well, if it's a military incident, that will be right. If, ships, if warships fire on commercial ships, warships of any nation firing on commercial ships of any, any nation, this is going to get a lot worse really fast. As long as the, there's no fighting, as long as no anti-ship missiles are, are launched, either deliberately or by mistake, since we launch anti-aircraft missiles by mistake, bear in mind, as long as no ships are sunk on purpose, 
I think the situation will gradually straighten itself out. Uh, I think this fear of Christmas being canceled, uh, I mean, that sounds like a children's special from the 1960s. Hey, I worry about it too. I don't want Christmas to be canceled. I don't think that's going to happen. I think the system will gradually straighten itself out. There is a gigantic money incentive to do this. Human beings respond to money rewards, and the shipping companies of the world will, will be handsomely rewarded if they get this all straightened out. And, and they're working on it right now, I can assure you. Greg, thanks for joining us. Sure thing, David. The Lawfare Podcast is produced in cooperation with the Brookings Institution. Please share the podcast and rate the podcast. And don't forget, you can become a material supporter of Lawfare at our Patreon page. This episode is edited and produced by Jen Pacha Howell. Hamza Shatu is our audio engineer, and Sophia Yan performed our music. As always, thanks for listening.